Sergei Lavrov, Russia's Foreign Minister. It's great to have you on our show today. Thank you for the invitation. Right, so just the other day, Joe Biden, on his uh, visit to Kiev, said that time is short for Russia to make progress on its commitments made in Geneva. What is expected of Russia? Uh, it's difficult to say, because I discuss this almost daily with Joe Kerry, uh, John Kerry, and uh, frankly, the American colleagues uh, chose to put all the blame on Russia, uh, including the origin of the conflict and including the steps which must be taken. They accuse us of having Russian troops, Russian agents in the east and south of Ukraine. They say that it is for the Russians uh, only uh, to uh, give orders and the buildings illegally occupied would be liberated. Uh, and that it is for the Russians uh, to make sure that uh, the east and south of Ukraine uh, stops putting forward the demands for federalization and referendum and so on and so forth. This is absolute, um, uh, you know, uh, switching the, the goalposts, if you wish. In Geneva, we all agreed that there must be a reciprocal approach to any illegitimate action in Ukraine, be it in Kiev, be it in the West, be it in the East, be it in the South. And the people who uh, started the process of illegitimate actions must uh, step back first. Uh, it is absolutely uh, abnormal uh, due to any norms in, 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 European, uh, in a European city that Maidan is still occupied, that the buildings uh, in Kiev are still occupied and in some other cities, that those uh, who uh, put on fire the buildings uh, belonging to the Communist Party headquarters in Kyiv, the buildings belonging to the trade union headquarters, uh, are not even uh, under investigation. I, I don't want even to mention the uh, sniper cases, because everyone forgot about those snipers. And we only uh, hear that uh, let's concentrate on um, eliminating terrorist threat in the east and in the south. So in Geneva, we all agreed that there must be end of any violence. Uh, next morning or next afternoon, uh, Turchinov declared the state uh, almost a state of emergency and ordered the army uh, to shoot at the people if the people uh, are engaged in peaceful protests. Uh, in Geneva, we agreed that there must be total rejection of extremists. And the right sector is still very active. And after Geneva, the right sector staged provocations, killing se several people in, in the vicinity of Slavyansk uh, during the Easter Sunday. In Geneva, we all agreed that there must be amnesty to political protesters. Uh, instead of that, uh, the uh, popularly elected governor uh, of uh, Donetsk, Pavel Gubarev, remains uh, in prison. Uh, more arrests have been made. Uh, we discussed it in Geneva, and uh, John Kerry told us that the Ukrainians are ready to grant amnesty to all those who would be ready to vacate the buildings and to surrender arms. Uh, Pavel Gubarev never was one of those who uh, stormed the buildings. He never possessed any arms. He was arrested only because after he was elected by the people in the, street, in the streets, uh, he called for a referendum to, dis, uh, to determine whether Ukraine should, should become a federation, mm -hmm. period. He is completely political, political prisoner. So nothing uh, which was agreed in Geneva and which certainly uh, is for the authorities in Kyiv uh, to start implementing was, was done by them. Yes, they introduced draft law on amnesty, uh, but our reading of that law indicates that this is not for political prisoners. Yes, they um, announced a pause uh, in the uh, what they call counter-terrorist operation, uh, but now that Joe Biden visited uh, Kyiv, this uh, counter-terrorist operation was declared in the active phase again. Uh, well, it's quite telling that they chose the moment of Vice President of the United States visit uh, to, to announce the resumption of this operation, because the launching of this operation uh, happened immediately after John Brennan's uh, visit to Kyiv. So I don't have any uh, reasons not to believe that the Americans are running the show in a very close way. Well, uh and you have called on John Kerry to actually put pressure on the government in Kiev and on its behavior, but does it really mean that you um, 
can see that America has decisive influence in the country? Uh, I think I think this is this is absolutely the case. Not in the country, on the on the regime which took power in Kiev, they have uh, I think overwhelming influence. Uh, they uh, act uh, in much more uh, open way without any scruples uh, compared to Europeans. Europeans try to uh, be a bit more subtle, uh, and uh, the fact that uh, you know there's so many reports uh, about the role of CIA in uh, uh, analyzing the situation and then being present in Ukraine, including the building of the Security uh, Council of, of, of uh, the uh, Ukrainian state, occupying uh, a floor. Uh, then there were numerous reports uh, which were revived recently. Uh, what, were the role, what was the role of the American embassy uh, during the events in Maidan? Uh, direct uh, interaction and communication with the activists who were armed and who were planning uh, the uh, actions like storming the buildings uh, and other illegal acts. Uh, all this uh, has not been denied uh, in the way which would be persuasive. And yes, when you, when you uh, get daily phone calls from John Kerry telling you, you must, you must, you must, and when you understand uh, how many thousand kilometers the United States is away from Ukraine, uh, and then you see how agitated they are uh, about seeing their um, sponsored uh, people uh, not really delivering uh, on, the th on the things which are obvious, then you cannot avoid the impression that they are running the show very much, uh, very much. What about Russia? I mean, I know Russia has reiterated many times that uh, it doesn't recognize the legitimacy of the government in Kiev, but nevertheless, diplomatic um, meetings are held at high levels. I mean, in Geneva, I remember in Hague, you were meeting the interim foreign minister as well. Does Moscow has any leverage over Kiev? Not over Kiev. No, not at all. What about the East? In, uh, in the East, the people revolted uh, after several months of total neglect of the interest. Uh, and when they saw what happened in Kyiv, uh, through Maidan, through the right sector, other extremists, uh, the sniper fire killing dozens of people, uh, then immediately all those who were uh, against the Yanukovych government were granted amnesty, uh, which is not happening now to the people who, who just engage in political activities in the East and in the South. Then the uh, instinctive reaction of the new regime, which was endorsed by the Maidan uh, before they were elected by the Rada, don't forget that Maidan was the place where these people got legitimacy, quote unquote. Uh, the first instinctive reaction of this regime uh, to the change of government was to cancel the law uh, which granted uh, regional status to Russian and other uh, non-Ukrainian languages. Yes, they didn't cite the law. They didn't, I mean, the, the uh, speaker of the parliament didn't si uh, sign the law, but the, the move was very telling as to what are the real uh, instincts uh, and plans uh, of the new authorities. Uh, and later they were uh, clearly, you know, discussing things uh, which showed the chauvinistic nature of the coalition. Don't forget that the coalition uh, embraced the Svoboda party which bases its uh, platform, its political platform, uh, on the declaration adopted by collabor collaborationists uh, in, uh, the, in June 1941, saying that you, real Ukrainians must cooperate with Hitler in bringing new order to Europe. So this is the kind of people uh, whom the United States embraces as part of the coalition. I keep asking John Kerry, why cannot you just pronounce yourself bluntly uh, what, uh, as, as regards the political uh, nature of the Svoboda Party, of the right sector movement. Uh, because in private discussions, he says that it is not acceptable to promote anti-Semitic, uh, chauvinistic uh, views and the terrorist behavior. But the Americans never said publicly anything uh, negative about Svoboda or the right sector. Mm -hmm. they, keep, they keep thinking or, and saying that they are drifting towards the political mainstream. But this is absolutely not true. So yes, we, 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 we um, 
see what, what was the reasons of the revolt in the East and in the South. They just don't want the repetition of what happened in Kyiv and what was attempted in Crimea, by the way. Uh, and these people, uh, of course, they, uh, they want to be friendly with Russia. They uh, have many Russian relatives. And they listen very carefully to what Russia says. But these people are not puppets. And uh, we cannot just um, guarantee that they would be ready to uh, take for granted whatever promises they hear from Kyiv. They are fed up with words. They need real deeds. The regime must uh, withdraw the order to use the army against the people. The regime must liberate political prisoners. They must start doing what they committed themselves uh, to on 21st of February, signing an agreement which said surrender illegal arms. They must start disarming the right sector. And they must stop just saying we will invite the regions to a constitutional reform process. They must sit down with them. Uh, and instead of going abroad, uh, you know, I, I heard that Yatsenyuk is going to, to the Vatican. Uh, I think the, the, better, the better place for him to go would be south. Uh, when he went there a week ago, he only met with the people whom he himself appointed. He never got to the uh, people who were protesting. And that's, and that's where the uh, current authorities in Kyiv uh, need to be now, if they really pretend to represent the entire country. But here's the thing, um, people in the West, and I'm not even talking about the American political establishment, just regular people who watch TV. For them, what's going on in the South um, and the East of the country right now is very similar to what was going on in Maidan because they see self-defense forces, like they were seeing the Red Sector in Maidan, cows, people occupying the government buildings, um, not willing to put down arms. Now, they're saying, you know, these people are pro-Russian, so why Russian Russia isn't so outraged at what's going on there? I mean, the cows, like they were in Maidan, and why don't they use their influence to calm them down? Well, no, I don't think, I don't think we, can, we can say that we are um, negligent of, of, of their problems. We are in solidarity with them. We insist politically that their interests must be taken into account. And that's why we went to Geneva. That's why we negotiated the paper which demands uh, an equal treatment of whoever is engaged in illegal activities on the understanding that the government, uh, the interim government, whatever they call themselves, must show the example. And they must uh, stop the Ill illegal things which continue to happen in uh, in Kyiv and in other parts of the country, not uh, uh, other than East and South. And yes, the East and the South, uh, the leaders elected by the people said that we would be ready to surrender arms, uh, to vacate the buildings, provided the government stops illegal orders to use the army and does uh, what it committed itself to do with the right sector, other extremists, uh, and uh, uh, with the buildings which have been uh, taken over and still uh, are occupied in Kyiv. You know what uh, the Americans said, uh, Victoria Nuland, I think, uh, when we uh, insisted on Geneva Agreement to be implemented in full, uh, beginning with the liberation of the buildings in Kyiv. She said those buildings are occupied legally because the Kyiv authorities issued license uh, to the people who, are, uh, who occupied these buildings and they are now legal, legal owners, so legal, uh, uh, legally present in, the, in those buildings. It's, it's, uh, it's absolutely unbelievable that they can seriously put forward such arguments. But so you're saying the, the um, agreement that was reached on the 21st of cent, uh, February by the Western powers was kind of ignored by those who signed it, but now you're saying the Geneva Agreement is also being ignored. Absolutely. So what's the point of all this agreement if you can't come to a solution, a, pr a practical solution to this? The point of 21st of February agreement was to have Yanukovych sign up uh, to, uh, to commit himself not to use police, which he did. Uh, to commit himself not to declare the state of emergency, which he did. And basically that was an act of capitulation. Everything uh, he committed himself to do has been done. Uh, people say that he didn't sign the law bringing back the previous constitution, but this law was promulgated anyway. So whatever was needed by the opposition was done. Whatever opposition committed itself to do, they never did. 
And the Geneva Agreement uh, was the Geneva meeting was actually designed to try to bring the process back on track, including the, the uh, need to start a constitutional process with full involvement of all, of all regions. And yes, the deal was struck, uh, but it is not being honored by those who have to make the first step. So uh, they have to make the first step. Absolutely. Russia they cannot pressure the self-defense forces no, to put down we, arms And we, would, we, we don't have any moral authority uh, to pressure the East and the South to do something unilaterally in front of the uh, army uh, being ordered to uh, go against them, in front of the right sector, who should have been, must have been uh, disarmed long ago, and in, in, if, uh, in, in the face of the political uh, prisoners uh, continue to be taken. Mm -hmm. um, you've also said many times that Russia has no intention of moving its troops inside Ukraine. Uh, just recently, Dmitry Peskov, Russian President's press secretary, has confirmed that there is a military contingent that is reinforced on the Russian-Ukrainian border. Um, there must be a worst-case scenario in which this contingent will be used. What do you think is the worst case? Well, we never denied that uh, we moved additional troops uh, on the border, uh, just like Ukrainian uh, authorities uh, moved the troops closer to the uh, Russian borders because they moved them to the east and south regions. Uh, our troops are on our territory. They were engaged in training, and that these trainings became uh, regular after Sergei Shaigu became Minister of Defense. Uh, last f summer and last fall, there were exercises in the east and in the Siberian part of Russia. Uh, then there was an exercise in the region of central Russia, close to Ukraine. Uh, now I think uh, they are planning uh, new training uh, games uh, in the northwest of Russia. So it's an ongoing process because the army must feel itself fit and ready. Uh, in the expectation that they would never, that they would never be required to do anything. Right, but, but if, well, uh, What's the worst case if, if we are attacked, uh, we would certainly respond. Uh, if our interests, uh, legitimate interests, the interests of Russians have been attacked directly, like they were in South Ossetia, for example, I don't see any other way uh, but to respond in full accordance with international law. Russian citizens being attacked uh, is an attack against the Russian Federation. The only thing I would like to highlight at this stage is that the Russian troops are on the Russian territory. Uh, the requests for inspections uh, under the so-called Vienna document of 2011 and under the Treaty of the Open Sky, they all have been granted. The in inspectors visited the areas of deployment of the, the troops participating in the training exercises. The planes uh, overflight uh, the um, areas of exercise. And no one but who participated in the inspections, including the Americans, Ukrainians, and Europeans, uh, ever brought up any fact which would indicate that Russia was engaged in some dangerous military activity. Uh, so we are on our territory and we are doing nothing which is prohibited by any obligation of us. The Ukrainian troops are also on their territory, but the difference is the, difference, uh, is the fact that they have the order from Turchinov to use weapons against civilians. And this is uh, a criminal order. No, OSC observers have also said that there are signs of foreign military <coughs> Ukraine. State Department thinks, seems to think those are Russians. What do you think? Well, the military observers, at least what I read uh, last from them, uh, they said that they have no, uh, no proof that there are uh, Russian military advisors. There are signs that there could be foreign military advisors, but they still have to monitor and to understand better what is going on. Uh, the, only, the only specific thing which uh, the Americans say, apart from faked computer images, uh, which they circulate uh, all over the place, the only specific reference they, they, they made was the fact that uh, people were using uh, Russian arms. But everyone uses Russian weapons, Russian small arms. 
uh, and light weapons in Ukraine, Kalashnikov and Makarov uh, uh, pistols. Uh, so this is, this is not something which is really uh, very much persuasive. But uh, we have seen a couple of days ago on TV the discovery of uh, uh, the storage of American-made munition and weapon, and we would like this to be investigated. Uh, because there were reports, as you know, that some several hundreds of uh, the um, private uh, military organization called Greystone uh, were uh, detected uh, to arrive in, the, in, the, in, in the Ukraine from the United States. There were several reports that in some of the incidents uh, foreigners were uh, detected. So we would like this also to be investigated. We raised this with the American colleagues. They said that they had no knowledge of this going on, then they said that they approached the, organiza the organization itself, the Greystone, and that they denied this. Uh, but uh, we would like to be uh, really uh, very certain of what, who is doing what, because there have been uh, so many um, distortions of reality, let me put it diplomatically. You've mentioned John Kerry many times during this interview, and it does seem like the two of you, regardless of the political differences, communicate and see each other more than you see your family members. <clears throat> Do you feel like on a personal level this is someone that you can come to an agreement with? Well, we came to an agreement on Syria, we came to an agreement on, on Iran, uh, we came to an agreement uh, on Ukraine and Geneva on the 17th of April. Uh, personally, we have very good chemistry. Uh, but we also understand that, uh, you know, there are uh, superiors, there are advisors, um, which sometimes doesn't help. Uh, but uh, I told Kerry several times that we do not believe it is a real partnership, uh, if they speak about partnership, uh, when, uh, in fact, uh, whatever, whatever issue we discuss, they try to put uh, the onus on us completely. Uh, and by the way, had it been not for Ukraine, there would be something else. Like it was Iran originally, when the Americans were saying, you must, you must, you must. If only Russia tells the Iranians, if only Russia doesn't sell weapons to Iranians, they would cry uncle and everything would be fine, this nuclear issue would be resolved. Then Syria happened. And they were telling us, they still do, uh, if only Russia tells us that go, everything would fall into pieces, into, into place, uh, democracy would prevail, and so on and so forth. So Iranian issue depends on, on Russia alone. Syria depends on Russia alone. They also say Russia and Iran. Now Ukraine depends entirely on Russia. It's an absolute, <laughs> I would say, egoistic and unrealistic approach and an attempt to hide your own uh, responsibility. Uh, this, this is something. By the way, speaking of Syria, they uh, said recently, and unfortunately, the United Nations uh, spokesman uh, picked up the tune. Uh, the Americans said recently that the elections which have been announced uh, for the 3rd of June uh, by President Assad uh, would be uh, illegitimate uh, because first there must be transitional governing order, uh, transitional governing organ on the basis of a new constitution and so on and so forth. Um, okay, Geneva Agreement, uh, Geneva Communique on Syria did say there must be transitional governing organ uh, which would develop constitutional reform and then on the basis of this reform there would be general elections, fine. But the same sequence was mentioned in the uh, agreement on the Ukrainian crisis, uh, signed on the 21st of February. First, the government of national consent, uh, then the constitutional reform, and only after the new constitution is promulgated, elections. The uh, people who uh, staged the coup uh, and uh, toppled uh, the legitimate president and took power, declared themselves government, they uh, did not speak originally about the constitutional reform at all. They said there would be presidential elections on the 25th of May. 
And the constitutional reform, uh, when we reminded them that this was the obligation, and unless they uh, do this, the East and the South would not recognize the legitimacy of what is going on, okay, they recalled this uh, obligation, uh, but said this would be done later. And the West believes that this is entirely legitimate. The same people, the same people, the same people who say that uh, the Syrian uh, presidential elections uh, without constitutional reform would be legitimate are ready, not ready, they are accepting uh, even today the legitimacy of the 25th of May uh, presidential elections in Ukraine without any constitutional reform. So Russia is not going to recognize these elections that are coming? Well, we will recognize uh, something which would be based on the all-inclusive process. And to call elections uh, without uh, finding uh, some uh, common ground with the East and the, uh, and the South of Ukraine, I think is very destructive for the country. They should just follow with deeds, you know, uh, and uh, deliver on what they uh, promised to do. Namely, eventually they said, okay, there would be constitutional reform. There would be a discussion of the status of the Russian language. That's what East and South uh, request. But they have to start the process which would be making sure that all Ukrainian regions are comfortable, that they are being heard, and that they are being involved, engaged in this process on an equal ground. And then, of course, after this, after this process is over, after this reform is done, and we believe it should be brought to a referendum, uh, be it a federation, be it this decentralization. Uh, John Kerry, by the way, in Geneva, he even said during a press conference that there would be autonomy for the regions. Fine, we don't care what it would be called. We want to make sure that the regions are satisfied, that they are masters of their own destiny within the state which respects their rights uh, as far as language, culture, history, traditions, heroes, and many other things are concerned. As, as far as the right to interact with their neighbors across the border is concerned. Because there are many region to, to region uh, co cooperative schemes between Russia, Russia and Ukraine. So they want uh, to elect their own leaders. They want to keep more taxes you know, for themselves, for the development of their areas, and not to give everything to Kiev and then uh, expecting for some handouts. But you talk to a lot of American politicians, except for John Kerry, um, and the rhetoric from both sides have been real harsh. Do you feel like um, America is ready for a real harsh confrontation with Russia over Ukraine? Well, I already said that it is not about Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine is just one manifestation of the uh, American uh, unwillingness uh, to yield uh, in the geopolitical fight. American, uh, Americans are not ready uh, to admit that they cannot run the show in each and every part of the globe from Washington alone. Uh, they cannot impose their ready-made solutions uh, on everyone. And they cannot understand that, I mean, they begin to understand, I think, but. Uh, they, still, they still have the instincts that they uh, shouldn't really take on board what others believe uh, should be done. Uh, they're moving slowly. That, that's why you know, we managed uh, to make some compromises on, on Syrian chemical weapon, on Iranian nuclear program, the compromise on, on, on Ukraine and Geneva. But uh, after a deal, they try to pocket whatever they got, and they try not to deliver what they promised to do. Uh, maybe this is a natural manifestation of those who, who want you know, to get the result, uh, which would be in their interests. But uh, on Iranian nuclear issue, for example, the deal was very blunt. But as the deal started to be implemented, the Americans uh, began to load it with new demands missile program of Iranians was never part of the discussion, never. And it was not part of the deal signed in Geneva last November. But as the deal of November started being implemented, the Americans uh, threw in 
the missile proliferation problem, which could have you know, derailed the process. Uh, on Syria, we signed a deal on the chemical disarmament of Syria, and the process was going, has been going, still goes very well. Uh, satisfactory assessment by the United Nations uh, personnel participating in the process by the Organization on Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, and so on and so forth. The Americans, from almost from the very first day, started uh, to you know, ring alarm bell, saying that the government is dragging on this, it's uh, not delivering on its commitments, and they were fully ignoring the, the facts, uh, which were the need for the government to get more armored vehicles, which we and the Chinese were helping them, uh, the need for the people who influence the armed extremists and jihadists to absolutely control them and not to allow them to stage provocations as the chemical weapons uh, being moved, you know, from the storages to the port, and so on and so forth. So every time we sign a deal, the Americans start to put, uh, start, you know, to put the blame for any delay on others, or even worse, they start uh, to throw in new demands which absolutely, absolutely contradict uh, the uh, reached um, consensus. So that's what they're doing now on Geneva, uh, agreement on Ukraine. But I do hope very much that they uh, would act responsibly and they would think not of the geopolitical um, I, initiatives, the geopolitical interests, uh, um, unilateral interests, but they would think about the future of Ukraine which is our biggest neighbor, uh, closest neighbor, uh, and uh, the people of which uh, are brothers and sisters uh, to the Russian Federation population. So if we all think about Ukraine and not about uh, who takes it, but about how the Ukrainians themselves want to live, then it shouldn't be very difficult uh, to help the Ukrainians uh, to find the national compromise and national reconciliation. Sergei Lavrov, Russia's Foreign Minister, thank you very much for this interview. Thank you.